we've got Paul Matthews, who's the president of the BCLP. We've got Don Wilson, the leader of the BCLP. Howdy. And we've got Sandra Philosoph Shipper. She is a board member. And I'm Kyle McCormack, and I'm also a board member. When, when we're looking at things like this, like big public emergencies and the inevitable actions that governments are going to take in response to these public emergencies, uh, we as libertarians have a particular concern, and that concern is related to emergency powers being adopted by governments and those emergency powers sticking around well after the crisis has, has wrapped up and, uh, and we're trying to move on with our lives. And so that's kind of the general theme of what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, this incredible, uh, I guess you'd call it a statement or, or like a, a declaration was put together by the BC Civil Liberties Association and a couple of other groups. And uh, I wanted to kind of go through their seven recommendations for how governments should, should uh, proceed as they consider adopting emergency powers. Prioritize approaches that help people stay at home that do not involve surveillance. So that's their very first thing they want to do. Uh, this is all being related to data collection, right? Governments right now are talking about collecting data, having people install apps on their phones. Um, and right away, the BC Civil Liberties Association threw up a big red flag. They said, whoa, 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 hang on here. Uh, we want to make sure that we're looking at every option that doesn't involve surveillance first. So that's their very, very first point. And I kind of want to go around the table and just sort of collect your guys's response to that. I think Don, we'll start with you. Uh, you know, what sort of, you, they recommend using public education, financial assistance, other options to help people stay at home voluntarily. I want to know kind of what you think about that. Is that appropriate for government to be doing? What is the right action before they arrive at surveillance options? Um, I think before we get to that point, though, there's, you know, we need to, we need to answer the, the fundamental question of how much, how much are we going to restrict the movement of the population, right? How much, what's a reasonable amount of restrictions to place on the population in this particular pandemic? Um, you know, and, and I think you see uh, other juris some jurisdictions are, are taking a far more strict approach to that um, than BC is, uh, at, least, at least from the legal side of it. You know, we have our public health officer has, I think, five or six orders. Most of them are pretty broad, um, you know, related to people. It, she's prohibited us from gathering in groups of 50 or more. Uh, she's prohibited restaurants from having sit-down diners and an order for all travelers to uh, to quarantine um, for 14 days when they come into into BC or into Canada. And so that's what's in place here. Um, and it seems, you, I think you have to say that BC's social distancing measures are working as well as any place on the globe. So, you know, if you take that and you look at places you know, down south where, or, or even even here in BC and, and, and in Canada, um, and I think it's even more egregious in the States where people are being arrested for walking their dog or being out on the lake or surfing. Um, these kind of restrictions clearly are not necessary. It's mostly through, I think, education and communication um, about the virus. And while there's been some, you know, there's been some misinformation and errors, I think in my opinion anyways, is, is looking at the public health officials here in BC anyways. Um, they've been pretty good about being transparent about what information they believe in and that they're relying on. Um, and I think that helps people follow along and make decisions that are rational, um, you know, as close to rational as possible. Okay, okay. Paul, your thoughts on uh, using approaches to help people stay at home that do not involve surveillance? Well, I, I think that... Uh... The, the key word that, that Don used was voluntary. You know, we, we should be empowering people with good information um, on, on how to protect themselves and protect others around them, right? So, um, you know, credit where credit is due. British Columbia has actually, you know, compared to many other jurisdictions across uh, uh, North America and the world has taken a pretty measured approach to everything. You know, we're, we're not arresting people and 
uh, you know, actually putting people under under strict house arrest. Um, but you know, I think the question must be asked. You know, should should the government be really uh, enacting any measures at all when even the information that they're acting on is incomplete? Uh, this is a, a new virus, and and um, although very concerning and and has some very uh, uh, very concerning side effects to to certain segments of the population. Um, you know, they really seem to have uh, come down hard in terms of shutting down, uh, you know, all restaurants, all gatherings, you know, everything else. And and there are other measures that that could be taken, and most of them voluntary. I, you know, again, um, I think information is key, and um, most people, when when given good information, will act intelligently uh, on that information, whether it's uh, wearing masks and gloves. Um, you know, doing the social distancing six feet apart from one another, uh, not attending gatherings, not not going to visit their elderly grandparents, per, you know, perhaps. Um, as far as um, the government doing surveillance on people, I think that's just an absolute non-starter for me. Um, the, the government's role is to, um, is to protect our freedoms. And, and that isn't to say that anyone can just do what they want and, um, you know, and completely disregard the danger of this thing. Uh, but the, the key is, is to create the conditions necessary so that, you know, so that our freedoms are protected and that our society can, can uh, continue to flourish. And the uh, fact of the matter is, is that shutting down the economy prevents all sorts of innovations that could actually help with this entire thing, right? Whether it's the supply of surgical masks or nitrile gloves, um, you know, the, the limitation on healthcare options, um, you know, there, there's a huge inability for the, uh, for the government to scale up the, the capacity of the healthcare system to deal with this. So now, you know, we've canceled all sorts of elective surgeries and prevented people from going to visit their doctors. Uh, you know, doctor's offices are closed because they're, you know, they, they're um, unable to maintain the social distancing guidelines set forth by the government. So, I mean, there's, there has to be a balance here, um, and uh, in my mind, the balance has to be, you know, firmly on the side of um, allowing people to voluntarily uh, do what they can to, to protect themselves and others, and they can only do that when given good information. And a quick note here, uh, over in Europe, Italy and Germany, uh, mobile carriers are already sharing aggregated location data with governments so that they can see if people are complying with social distancing and not going to public events. Uh, Sandra, your, your thoughts on, on methods? My, my thoughts are, um, I'm going to yeah. play devil's advocate here for a second, because obviously I'm in the Libertarian Party, so you kind of know my views. But... Um, I think people want the government to do something. We see this with climate change. We see this with whatever else is, is the concern. Um, so if the government backed off and did nothing, there'd be a lot of blame there too. A lot of people would be very unhappy. Is it a good idea for them to do nothing? Maybe. Um, Paul has a very valid point. We would have more personal protection equipment if the free market was allowed to run with it. There are now people, resellers are being fined um, because it's whatever reprehensible and all that. You know, maybe it's a little vulture-ish, but I wouldn't think it's the end of the world. And if, and if resellers were rewarded for selling material, i.e. with money, then there'd probably be more of it. And we all know that. So what is the appropriate role of government is the, the main thing. Well, that's going to vary from person to person. A lot of people want government to do, to do that. You know, there's these surveillance things people are volunteering for. And I was telling, I think, Paul recently that I have a friend who, after being a world traveler, went home to Hong Kong and was thrilled with how careful they were being. But they had, she had to load an app and she had to have, wear a, a non-removable bracelet and go home and, and in this app feed the perimeter of her own home so that if she crossed it, alarm bells would go off. It would, it would elicit a, a police response or something like that. She thought that was great. And for me, I just thought, are you kidding? But, but you know, if the only goal is to control the disease, then it's great. But that can't be the only goal. 
So what concerns me is not just the, the surveillance, the enabler of surveillance, the fact that no one asked me if I, you know, if I'm okay with it or you when I signed on for my cell phone contract, et cetera. But it, there's no clear exit plan for this, okay? It's an emergency measure, and I get that. This isn't a normal day. But at what point, tell me now, what three, four, or five things have to happen, or one thing has to happen before this is all switched off, and then, and I would like to buy into it, whether I want to toggle it back on or not in case the next emergency or anything. They're not asking us our opinion, and they've sidestepped due to emergency measures, and I, I do understand an emergency is just that, an emergency, but my real question here is how are we going to prevent this from becoming the new normal? Well, the goal, the goals have to be properly outlined, right? Yeah, including you know, the exit plan. Well, no, but I think even before that, you know, with these lockdown measures, you know, they, they talk about flattening the curve. Uh, but again, we have a gap in information, right? There's uh, some, some evidence out there to suggest that, um, you know, 50 to 80% of the people that actually catch the virus are completely asymptomatic. They don't, they don't get it. Um, you know, so... Is, is the goal here to completely eradicate the disease? Are we going to do like a, a Trudeau approach where we're going to have a, a lockdown situation until supposedly a vaccine is developed? Or is the goal here to manage the disease, right? Um, well, that's not even been defined, as you say. Like, well, and that's, to eradicate it, well, how many of us are going to die from starvation and, and other diseases? And the economic displacement. Well, well yeah. And the, and the social consequences of the, you know, of this recession or, or, you know, in some cases a depression that's coming, you know, you're going to have um, a whole lot of people out of work, uh, out of income. Suicide uh, is up and domestic abuse is already up. So. Exactly. So we're already starting to see this. And so, you know, really what's lacking here in terms of, of the, the government response is a cost benefit analysis. Um, you know, Again, we understand that, that this virus has um, some very serious consequences for, for particular segments of the population, that is the elderly, uh, immunocompromised, you know, people like that, people who have uh, pre-existing conditions. Uh, but generally speaking, it, uh, it doesn't affect young, healthy people. And, and when I say young, like people under 60 who are in otherwise good health, um, really don't have a lot to worry about with this virus. Um, the risk is is the transmission to others, right? And when you start introducing measures like uh, universal lockdowns, there's the the distinct possibility that you're going to be locking down uh, young people who could be carrying this disease with with older people, right? Could be you know grandparents living with their families or even just older older parents. And uh, so, you know, that could uh, inadvertently, you know, be, uh, be uh, aiding the transmission to the vulnerable segments, segments of the population. Whereas if a government was to have, uh, you know, was to take specific measures as far as isolating the vulnerable segments, uh, you know, restricting access to um, long-term care homes, retirement homes, um, you, know, per, you know, perhaps even just doing screening before, uh, before they enter these places or screening at major public events, whether it's a hockey game or a football game or, or whatnot. What you kind know, of we can, screening, like taking test someone's temperature? Yeah. That's about all you can do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, but they've already, uh, um, Stanford just put out a, a study and, and what they did was they actually had a drive-through uh, testing system. Now, it doesn't test for the virus, but it tests whether or not you have the antibodies for the virus. That's even more important. Well, it is, and that's actually where some of the latest the latest data has come out of this, and it's and it's really suggesting that um, that this whole thing, uh, again, like I say, it's a very serious thing. I don't want to downplay the seriousness of the virus, particularly to those vulnerable groups, but what the study has revealed is that you know, again, the the um, there are a, a lot of people that have been infected with this thing and have the antibodies. They've had it, obviously had the virus in the past and were completely asymptomatic, right? Like the infection rates are something like 50 to 80% higher than what, um, than what was in, or I can't remember if it's 50 to 80% or 50 to 80 times a, a higher than what 
Um, and I know that's a big discrepancy. I can't remember the, the specifics on the, on the study. Um, but you know, basically what I'm getting at is that a lot more people have been infected than, in, than initially thought. And conversely, that means that the death rate is much lower than, than originally thought. So yeah. we should be, the government should be taking, if they're going to take any measures at all. And, and uh, just to reiterate, I didn't say that the government should do nothing. I think the government has a role to play here in terms of providing useful uh, and, and valuable information to the general public in terms of how to protect themselves and measures that they can take to, to protect themselves and, and those around them. Right, but uh, wholesale shutdown of of all public gatherings over 50 people and, and whatnot is um, it just seems like you know we're we're going way too far with that. Especially when especially when they enacted those policies, they were they themselves were acting on incomplete information. So um, you know I understand they operate on the precautionary principle, but more often than not, that actually causes more harm than good, and there are there are way too many un intended consequences that, uh, that come from policies like that. And like you say, it's the universality of it too. It's being broadly applied to groups. You know, rules are being applied to groups that, that don't need those rules applied to them. It could have been more individuated and based on, based on what each individual's needs. I want to keep moving through this list of seven recommendations to governments here. So number two, yeah. they recommend due process. This is a big one for me. Due process for the adoption of any new powers. Open public debate proper legislative process has to happen. Any new rules have to be temporary. Uh, and if there are new rules brought in, a third party, a, a commissioner should, you know, review the legality of it. And I'm going to fold number three in here too. Number three is that consent must be favored. You've all brought this up already in the discussion here, but it is one of their, their seven pillars. Options that allow people the choice to volunteer their data or voluntarily install an app must be strongly preferred to non-voluntary data collection. So due process and volunteerism, Don, we'll, we'll start with you, your thoughts on that. I agree with those. Uh, and it's good to remember those basic protections uh, that we have you know, requiring uh, the legislature to actually meet and discuss these things and debate these things and take them through the, the democratic process. Um, and to not, it, it's a, you see this on the big level and the small level, people kind of throwing out the ordinary way of doing things very quickly because they're so afraid of what they don't know or afraid of what's coming. And, you know, that, that's when, that's when I think, you know, people start getting hurt or institutions start breaking down or relationships start breaking down. You know, so you can see this on a personal level, on an organizational level or on a, on a provincial level or a state, state level. Um, yeah, you need to keep up those things that have been established over generations that we know work to, to check the worst abuses of the power of the state. So I think that's absolutely uh, right on the money um, and essential. Um, the, the temporary uh, aspect, you know, it's a great idea. It's just, uh, I can't remember who said it, but, uh, you know, there's that saying that there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program. And yeah. we all know that there's a lot of truth to that. It, even if it is, in fact, temporary, the measure usually acts as a precedent in future crises. And so it does, it does sort of set the, the tempo. I was actually thinking of a, I was thinking of a story, something I saw on, I think on Twitter, or social media anyways, I saw a video, of, I think maybe it was in Boston, I can't remember, it was an American city. And uh, these, um, it, was, it, was some, it was some county where they had already mandated face masks um, to be worn, uh, although it, it had not been done in a clear way, like the population had not been and, uh, told in a clear way. I actually think it was just on their trans, on their transit, like on their public transportation, some rule had been passed that people were supposed to wear face masks now, but they didn't really publicize it and it, it, it just, people didn't know, but they went out to enforce it rather than tell people or help people comply with it. Um, and so, you know, you got, I just saw this, you know, I saw this video of, of five or six police officers dragging this poor guy off the bus who was just, you know, on his way to work or something like that. And just literally, you know, manhandled, dragged off the bus and, and dumped unceremoniously on the side of the road. And I think, 
Yeah, it was on Twitter I saw it. And even the, um, the Transit Union, who kind of t tweeted that, I was happy to see that they actually even criticized to, a, to an extent the police action there. They said, we, well, they, they said something like, we have asked uh, uh, our, our police force um, if they could just, you know, hand out some masks instead of <laughs> like... Yeah. What a concept. Physically dragging, like beating people. It's completely unnecessary. Or just yeah. like tell the man, you know, right. to, or, you know, start with telling people clearly. I mean, that, that's not so much voluntary, voluntarism as, as much as that is bad governance. And just that's kind of more actually going back to your first question about uh, less coercive ways of, of enforcing these kind of measures or, or bringing about their, their adoption. Uh, but volunteerism, you know, and I, and I sort of answered that with my first answer, which was, you know, if you give people information, they're in a much better position to act rationally, uh, take the steps that they believe they need to do to, uh, to keep themselves safe. safe. Okay. Um, so, uh, and by the way, I just, I want to reconnect this back to Canada here so that we understand, because as Don said, it happens at different levels of government and we are setting precedents, right, for future crises. Uh, Alberta has already gone pretty far and kind of surprising to me, uh, yeah. annou announcing plans to enforce quarantine compliance via phone app. Uh, Sandra, your thoughts on, on consent and due process here? Well, okay, there's, there's the issue of due process is, is takes a lot more time than emergency measures. Right. So I'm not sure we can really have due process. I think we're in a position where we really have to rely on the government to exercise great caution in, in enforcing things. And, and like the idea, Don said, why aren't these cops just handing out a mask instead of dragging some poor man off a bus? We, you know, so my first question is, and it's going to vary from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and from place to place, country to country. Um, do the police know what are the parameters of what is appropriate behavior in this? This is as new to them as it is to us. Do they know? Did, did the, their police chiefs and et cetera, et cetera, tell them this is what you can and can't do? I mean, the five guys dragging some, some man off a bus, and first of all, they are not social distancing if they're doing that. So just, then what is the point of this exercise? Everyone in the area was better off when the guy just stayed on the bus and wasn't bothering anyone. So what is the goal here? Um, this, these kind of acts, really, they're courting rebellion. We've already seen, even here locally, these, these groups rebelling against lockdowns. Protesting, yep. Protesters, but they're really, I, yes, they're, they're probably the fringiest people, but I really understand their, I sympathize with their, with their cause. And it's what we're concerned about is government overreach. But in doing this, they have, endangered themselves or standing next to you know many other people holding their signs and screaming and that's imprudent as well right so i think when when government becomes too draconian you will elicit this response every action has an equal and opposite reaction and that's what we're getting right now would, ahead, would, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you say actually that's even going both ways because government's also reacting to people being, as you say, improved. Exactly. Every yeah. action has an equal and opposite reaction. In, in Victoria, you know, when the voluntary methods don't work, government just, you know, puts down the carrot and picks up the stick. In Victoria, they were asking the hotel managers to house homeless people. That's and when, something else. When the, home, when the hotel managers strictly refused, because of course they refused, to just house massive numbers of homeless people in their in their property, uh, the government in Victoria said, "Well, we're just going to take it. Then we'll just take your hotels. We'll see." Which them. is a very very frightening precedent. Yeah. So, but, because but again, that means they can take my house because they need it for something, whatever. They can take your house from. They can take if you're a renter, they can take your house anyway because it's your landlord's property this it's a very frightening precedent and, and it asks know, an interesting question though because who is responsible for those homeless populations you know i don't want to i don't want to dive down that rabbit hole necessarily yeah that is a rabbit hole but, but I, a I did read up a little bit on that so they they did try it in one hotel or something like that or motel and it ended badly because homelessness is not necessarily a function of pro um, poverty in, in most cases, it's, it's mental health and addiction issues, which often go hand in hand anyway. So what ended up happening is vandalism, destruction, and abuse of, of hotel workers. It didn't end up well. It's not something that, that we'd want to amplify into much many more properties. Um, 
but property now they want rights to force aside, now, it's now not they, a good solution. No. The no. weird thing is the homeless seem to be virtually impervious to the coronavirus. <laughs> Seriously, there's, there's studies that? coming out of, yeah, well, there's a study, there's, I've seen two studies now, one out of Boston and the other, I can't remember where the other one was out of, and uh, so I, I remember the, the one out of Boston quite specifically, they, they did universal testing at this homeless shelter um, at a, you know, as, a, as a study, uh, 36% of the homeless had coronavirus. Um, their symptoms, broadly speaking, so including like cough, fever, shortness of breath, um, uh, I think that's it, were, not, were no different than the rest of the, home, the homeless population in the shelter. Oh my God. No, so they had, they were well, indistinguishable. They're- their immune systems get a lot of practice. Okay, uh, Paul, your, uh, your thoughts yeah, jokes on the aside, process. I'm sure you're right. no, this will be a quick response for me. I mean, at the end of the day, I guess, if, if the government is going to go down this road, um, you know, of, of enacting surveillance measures and, and doing what they're doing, then absolutely, of course, due process and, uh, and public debate need to be had. Um, and if that means that our legislators need to get together in, in, the, in the legislature or in, or in the House of Parliament to, um, to have this debate, then, uh, then make it happen. Uh, but again, I, I think they've already gone too far. And the, the notion of the government doing uh, surveillance on the population is just completely unthinkable to me. Um, okay. Yeah. But, that's all I can say to that. Okay. <laughs> like it's so, ridiculous. Mo- yeah, mo- mo- <laughs> and and I understand where you're coming from. I I kind of want to frame this almost uh, the next part here. In let's assume a lot of people are voluntarily handing their information over to the government. Everyone That's- decides to opt in, just for the sake of argument here. Totally fine. Com- I'll combine number four and five uh, under under that pretext. So number four is put strict limitations on the data collection and on the retention of the data. The data that's collected has to be strictly what's necessary, and then it has to be deleted when it's no longer necessary. Who decides that? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question, and that's, that's one of the problems, for sure. Who, who decides when the data is no longer necessary? Who decides what information is no longer necessary? Number five is put strict limits on use and disclosure, which is kind of a related idea. All the data has to be de-identified, anonymized, only used for its stated purpose. Yeah, right. And most importantly, cannot be handed to other departments. This information doesn't end up in the hands of immigration authorities, or it doesn't end up in the hands of corporations. Uh, we'll, go, uh, we'll go to Sandra this time. Your thoughts on strict limits on data collection, if the government is going to collect data at all, which I think we kind of all think. Okay, so like you said, first we'll assume it's voluntary. Yeah. Next, we're going to go ahead and assume it is going to be used as they tell us it's going to be used. It's a lot of assumptions. I mean, how can we possibly guarantee that no one in any department is going to keep a copy and use it later for something? It just, it doesn't, it doesn't feel right to me. You don't trust Honestly. And I'm not a doctor at all, but I really, I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for letting this run its course in a managed way, which we've been doing, as they say, flattening the curve. People like to make fun of that, but I think it's a great idea, not economically necessarily, but where hospitals are not overrun. Paul? I, I'd argue that, um, again, the, the statistics underlying this whole flatten the curve thing uh, again, are completely wrong. There's a scarcity of tests. They're, they're only Agreed. testing people that go to hospital and are presumed to have it. In fact, BC has so few tests available and or so few labs available to conduct the tests that, that um, you know, even people that are symptomatic, they're not necessarily being tested either. On, only the most severe cases are being tested for, for COVID. So, which, which does skew the statistics of the infection rate and the death rate because they're only even seeing people that are, you know, have a foot in the grave. <laughs> I'd be more specific on that. Not only does it skew it, it inflates the number. Right? Yes. It's, it's inflated to make it look worse than it actually is. And again, I will qualify that statement by saying this is a serious outbreak and it's a serious disease, but there are, there are the data is being used in such a way to make the case for these for these government measures, and I, 
I, I simply don't agree with it. And especially the more time that goes by and the more we learn about it, the, the more it becomes clear that um, there's really no need for, for the level of government action that, you know, even here in British Columbia, where the government action has been fairly, um, fairly measured, again, compared to other jurisdictions. And Don, that video you saw was in Philadelphia. Right. And, and you're right. Some some counties in, in the states are just going absolutely nuts with this. Right. Dragging people off buses and arresting people for walking in the park. Um, you know, I was downtown Vancouver not too long ago. And yet pol police on bicycles are um, reminding people of social distancing. And, you know, I don't I don't know the conversations that are actually going on, but I see the police down there on their bikes. And they're uh, they're asking people to you know keep a safe distance. Um, it, it that to me seems very reasonable, right? Again, just giving people good information, uh, reminding people of the risks that are out there, but uh, ultimately still still relying on voluntary action for the most part, right? And uh, so I mean, credit where credit is due. B BC has has done well, but. Um, yeah, these other jurisdictions, have, I, again, and, and with more, the more data that comes out, it becomes clear that, um, you know, what, what Ontario's done in some of these counties down in the States and where the, the, the direction that Alberta is going uh, is totally uncalled for. Yeah, I, I saw some story about people in Ottawa being told they weren't allowed to drink beer in their front yards. In like, their yards. They weren't allowed to be talking to their neighbors. So now they're actually yeah, Ottawa's gone crazy. on our property now. So Don, your, your thoughts on, on, well, on data collection and retention on, on whether. Yeah. Well, and just on that, yeah, Ottawa, I mean, what, and they've closed their parks. I guess Vancouver did that as well. I just do not, it makes no sense at all. It's the virus is so hard to catch outside, especially, you know, if you're outside and you keep a bit of distance from people, you can't catch the, the bloody virus. Like it, it makes no sense to close down the parks. Ottawa is doing it. I heard Vancouver did it. I'm in new West and, Things have been great here, you know. I, I guess I'm lucky, um, but you know, people have been fairly relaxed and, and reasonable. You know, um, keep some space, take some precautions, but yeah, it discourage people from talking across the fence. Like, just leave it, leave it alone. I mean, it, it just, you know, this thing has been a wet dream for for authoritarians and the media uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, it just, it, it's been such an excuse to ratchet things up well beyond what was necessary. And, um, I wanted to echo Paul's point that even here in BC where it's been light, it's been effective, which, which means that these measures, what, you know, whether light or not, have either been exactly the amount that was needed or more than what was needed. And that's fine. But at this point, they should be, the only thing they should be considering is reducing those measures, not increasing surveillance this is not a time to be talking about surveillance the measures that they already implemented worked clearly um you know if any measures need to continue as i said they should be discussing what fewer measures could achieve the desired outcomes not not more so and surveillance is just completely it's obviously gratuitous it's obviously gratuitous at this stage it would, it would just be a boondoggle it just would be a massive expense clearly what we're doing is is has been more than enough we need to scale things back. We don't need mass, some massive new arbitrary program uh, to see, you know, just to test the limits of, of government control and surveillance. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the hospitals aren't overflowing. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're not, uh, we're not just like Italy, despite being told that any day now or any week now we're, you know, we're going to be Italy. Um, you know, there, yeah. there's so many factors are at play, you know, and I, and I've brought this, brought this up before in discussions with, um, with each one of you. Uh, you know, there are, there's other factors than just simply the transmission of the virus or, you know, or whatever. There's age, there's demographics, there's cultural practices, there's all sorts of things. And you, and you look at, um, you know, look at the case of Italy. Uh, you've got multiple generations living under a single household, right? That, that aids the transmission of the virus. And as we pointed out earlier, uh, you know, it, it, um, it really affects the, the elderly and the immuno, immunocompromised uh, particularly hard. Um, on top of that, the areas of Italy that have been hit the hardest are areas that have um, prevalent cases of, of uh, underlying uh, conditions, right? Whether it's obesity or diabetes or, uh, or certain respiratory diseases, whether it's asthma or emphysema, 
lung cancer. Uh, air quality has a major part to play in this whole thing. Uh, and then again, cultural practices. Look at, you know, Italians, hug and kiss everyone is a general practice, whether it's a, a family member or a stranger. You know, you meet someone at a cafe, it's a hug and kiss on both cheeks. And so the, you know, the prevalence of transmission in those in those places is a lot higher than a place like Vancouver, which is notoriously antisocial just on a good day. I was going to say, we've right? been practicing you know? social distancing for years. <laughs> Absolutely, right? You know, and uh, it's just... Um, the, those things need to be taken into account, right? And, and they're very uh, human aspects that, that aren't really taken into account in, in the statistics, right? And, uh, and again, when we talk about flattening the curve, we have to be mindful of the fact that the statistics are incomplete. We only have a very narrow picture of what we're dealing with here and, and with, the, um, with the scarcity that exists at all levels of our healthcare system right, whether it's availability of beds or ventilators or even just tests to figure out who, who has it, never mind antibody tests to find out who, who had it in the past and perhaps might have immunity. Um, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of missing information here and, and I'll say it again, right, the government has no right to be shutting down the entire economy and taking the measures that they have on incomplete information. Number six here, there must be oversight, transparency, and accountability. Now, this is a I mean, big one because how on earth can you possibly guarantee that the government is going to be open and transparent when they have a track record? They have a track record on that exact topic that is less than sterling, let's say. Uh, how do you create transparency and accountability, uh, in your opinion, if you wanted to have oversight over the collection of this data, uh, whether it's people's location data or just the data about who's got it, who doesn't have it, or, or where are those populations of infected people? How do you create transparency and accountability? Yeah. I don't think you can, <laughs> honestly. Well, they're, they're, you know, it's not in their best interest to, well, when they're, they're being they're having accountability they're going to show us their weaknesses which they never want to do and if there is something more nefarious going on well they're not going to tell us and you know i don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist here but um they don't seem to be hating more control well and you don't you don't need to be a conspiracy theorist to acknowledge that the government will never let a good crisis go to waste that well i would you know I would say that, you know, I, again, I have to give credit where credit is due. The government of British Columbia, you know, um, uh, John Horgan and Dr. Henry and, and, and Adrian Dix and, and the whole gang there, um, they, nothing here seems to be insidious. I truly believe that they are, they are acting in what they think to be um, the, the public's best interest, right? I completely disagree with their way of thinking and, and of course their political party and their ideology in general. Um, but I don't think that they have any malicious intent here. Um, as for the, the, you know, perhaps some of the bureaucrats and, and technocrats and, and whatnot that work for them. I mean, perhaps there are some, you know, some, uh, you know, ba bad intentions, we'll say. Uh, among those people, but uh, you know, again, we're you're just speculating at that point. As far as the the political leadership goes, I don't think there's any malicious intent here. Um, now, I got to ask you, Kyle, with this uh, statement from the BC Civil Liberties Association, um, has the BC government? And again, I haven't um, I haven't seen anything that indicates as such. But is, is the BC government intending to roll out measures like this uh, at this point. Uh, you know, we've been told that perhaps uh, May 1st, uh, they're gonna start, start lifting a lot of the measures, so. So I haven't heard anything from the BC government. Um, my my uh, concerns were more based on what the guys right next door to us are doing in Alberta, the okay. things that they're sort of threatening to propose there with Bill 10. And then you can also look internationally to jurisdictions like Taiwan. Taiwan is already, all the way over on the other side, tracking data and enforcing compliance through, through phone apps and the like. So 
No, I haven't heard an announcement from the BC government yet, though. That said, actually... though, Taiwan. That said, though, Taiwan didn't shut down their entire economy, right? So, so perhaps they're just taking different measures, and perhaps the their proximity to, uh, you know, ground zero, so to speak, um, you know, warrants. You know, and again, there's there's cultural differences as well, right? But you know, perhaps. And and then again, is the government um, forcing people to download these apps or wear bracelets, or is it a voluntary measure? You know, I'd, I'd like answers. Yeah, to those Taiwan questions. Taiwan's government is using cell phones to geofence. They call it geofence people in their homes. So yeah. if you leave your home and you've got your phone on you, or you t- turn your phone off, so you're not actually allowed to turn your phone off. Also, me- worth mentioning about Taiwan is they they had other measures in place as well like they they cut off travel right away from from hot spots they they were not they were not shy about that yeah just, and a, and another place where some enforcement is pretty heavy handed is Poland the government introduced an app that requires quarantine people to take and submit this is not the onion to take and submit regular selfies, selfies. To prove to prove that they are at home. So that's what the Polish government is up to. And people who don't do it are visited by the police. So, oh. so it's, it's about what could happen here, definitely. This is- Honestly, I prefer that route to them knowing where my phone is. I I'd, I'd, I'd definitely think I the geofencing thing makes my skin crawl. Uh, voluntarily submitting my location, I'm, I'm personally less worried about, but I don't see how that helps the government either, to be perfectly honest. Um, I like the Swedish government's response. They haven't locked down virtually anything. Right. right. And they their, per- their death rate is, is rising, as last I heard. Oh, but it? again, but again, Europe is dealing with a, an, L, like a, a, an older population. There's a higher, uh, it's the baby boomers, right? Demographics are different. The demographics are different, but you know the the death rate. Yes, it's rising, right? But again, they've done testing, and the prevalence of the disease in their population is quite high. So, like, although the gross number of deaths are going up, the the morbidity of the disease is no different than anywhere else, right? right. So, you know, we have to look at the data clearly and. Um, you know, despite the rising death rate and despite, uh, you know, perhaps an elderly, uh, you know, a larger elderly population, Swedish hospitals aren't overloaded either, right? So, you know, all of this has to be taken into context. And uh, I, you know, despite their many, many, many flaws in Sweden, I have to give them credit as far as maintaining a free and open society for the most part. They have limited large gatherings i believe over over 50 people or 100 people um you know but at the end of the day restaurants and bars are still open uh, manufacturing plants are still open the supply chain is still very much intact and and life goes on right they they are adapting and overcoming uh, i would argue and setting themselves up for later success much better than we are right they they're, they're going to come out of this whole thing I predict, anyway, they're they're going to come out of this whole thing much better prepared uh, and uh, than we are, right? Or many other places. Like, and I understand that you know, like, look at the UK. Uh, I mean, the UK is incredible. They've gone completely off the deep end with uh, complete and total lockdown, and the and you're not even allowed to go to the park and sunbathe by yourself, right? Never mind social distancing measures and whatnot. They are effectively the entire population of the UK is under house arrest, right? And, uh, and their death rates, I think they just surpassed 16,000 deaths, right? And yeah, that, that gross number is a very scary number to look at, right? But we have to keep, keep the entire picture into context. Right. And then again, take into consideration, you know, like we talked about earlier, how statistics are being skewed. It seems as though that the only thing people are dying from these days is COVID. You know, mm-hmm. there's no one dying from cancer anymore. People dying from the regular flu. Yes. You know, they're, they're not happening anymore. So, like, it seems to me some of the lines are being crossed and the numbers are being inflated. And, and I'm not saying that people aren't dying from COVID-19. Uh, and actually, I saw something else about this, right? It comes down to the verbiage. 
uh, you know, there's people dying with COVID-19 and dying of COVID-19, right? And the people who die of COVID-19 is relatively small and limited, right? But you could have people that have any number of pre-existing conditions that perhaps have their life cut short because they get infected with COVID-19. But at the end of the day, you know, they, they, and I don't want to sound cold hearted or anything, but they were going to die anyway. No, yeah, I get what you're saying. You know, because they had, you know, um, a chronic lung cancer, you know, or, um, you know, some sort of other terrible disease, whether it was heart disease yeah. or, or, you know, morbid obesity or something like that. But then that gets recorded as a COVID death because, yeah. So that's exactly. And so the data the, we're the, getting is very skewed then. We don't have the right information to be making, I would say, grand sweeping public policy decisions. Exactly right. Right. Okay. We're at the end of the list. This is the seventh and final recommendation uh, to governments. And uh, it's kind of already been covered, but we'll, we'll focus on it. Any surveillance efforts related to COVID-19 must not fall under the domains of security, law enforcement, or intelligence agencies. This is a public health crisis, not a national security crisis. So any information that is collected shouldn't end up in the hands of the RCMP, CSIS, any of these organizations. Uh, your guys' so if, thoughts. So if the intent is to enforce social distancing and quarantine orders and lockdowns and all that other stuff, then, you know, it, doesn't it, just connecting the dots here, doesn't it mean that ultimately that data has to end up in their, in their hands? Like perhaps exactly. the public... Perhaps the public health department will collect it, but at the end of the day, if the public health department, you know, detects on that data that someone is, you know, walking their dog in a park and they come into close proximity to someone else, aren't they going to dispatch the police? And then, and then if we're going to use due process and the court system and whatnot, um, you know, doesn't that evidence ultimately have to be turned over to the, to the authorities, you know, whether it's the justice department or the police themselves? So it's a bit of a litmus test almost to see what the real goals and intentions of policymakers are. Again, there's just so many gaps in the data and, and there seems to be very little effort in, especially in British Columbia, to fill those gaps, right? To this day, we're still only testing the most probable and severe cases, right? Um, and that, that is the biggest flaw in this whole thing from the BC perspective. Well, they're, they're tr it seems like they're treating it like it, it only had a very narrow entry into the jurisdiction and that they are aware of most of or all of the chains of transmission and they are closely tracking all of those chains of transmissions and they only need to test those people who have come in contact with those chains of transmissions that that will but again. But again, there's studies coming out from uh, from Stanford and Yale universities that suggest that uh, the the disease is far more prevalent in our population oh, than for sure. than no, we were led to believe. Right. So yeah, it's, no, it's, it's so absolutely it's, that that basis that they're proceeding on. It seems to be that that's the basis they're proceeding on, which is patently right. not the case. I, I don't quite know what like Dr. Henry seems very intelligent and competent, so I I don't know how she could believe what she seems to believe and that she has that, that, that they have some level of control over the transmission or some handle on the transmission of this province. Like it just seems like a very strange idea and I don't know what, where, how anybody could come up with that. I know belief. face, I know Facebook is a terrible, uh, terrible way to kind of get the impression of kind of the general public's view on things. Cause you know, it can often be narrow, but you know, the, the number of people that, um, that I've seen on, on say on my Facebook feed uh, that are, that are healthcare workers. It seems to me that they're incapable of actually looking at the, the data objectively. Their, you know, their attitude is save lives at any cost. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it's easy for them to say that because they still have a job. Um, and I, you know, I just, I don't think they understand the full, um, you know, what the cost is, right? And, and any cost is a, that's a big cost, you know, to shut down the economy and to quarantine people and, and do all of these things. And Dr. Henry uh, falls into that category. I don't yeah, I think, you know, she, she just can't look to look at the, 
the big picture objectively. I, I just read an article on Mises, Mises Institute, um, their website about learned ignoramuses, which is a harsh word, but it's like, of course, she's going to give you a very narrow view because that is her area of expertise. Yep. So, and, and if you talk to solely an economist, they're going to give you also a very narrow point of view. And, you know, I'm, I'm not hopeful for finding that perfect balance. I mean, if anyone has, maybe it is BC because we're all, you know, kind of careful and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and let's be fair here. We've also got lots of space to do that in. We're not all living all clumped up together like they do in, in well, many places. You don't have to go all the way to China to find places that are crowded. Well, that said, though, I think there's, you know, there's a case to be made, uh, you know, for a, a decentralization of this kind of decision making, right? Um, I would say that, you know, uh, com communities like Vancouver and perhaps even Victoria, um, you know, where they're, yeah, they're densely packed cities, but they're still also quite young, vibrant populations compared to, say, you know, Up Island a little bit in Nanaimo or Qualicum Beach, um, you know, where those are basically retirement communities, um, you know, perhaps the, the reaction to all of this needs to be decentralized a little bit more. That's right? fair. So you know, that can, uh, each community can sort of decide what's appropriate based on the demographics and the information that they have the information most readily accessible to them. Like people who are working for the federal government out in Ottawa don't know the particulars of the community in Port Coquitlam. You the, know, they last, might... the last people who should be making decisions on quarantining oh, and everything are the feds, yeah. right? Uh, and, and to some degree, even the provincial government, you know, the provincial government, you, you nailed it, Kyle, just providing the information required. Uh, and even then, you know, city councils tend to be pretty heavy handed and, and authoritarian uh, at, at, their very, at their very nature. So, sometimes they're often the worst. Um, but, you know, again, there's a case to be made that some communities need to handle this differently than others, right? Kelowna, f for sure, doesn't need to be in full lockdown, right? They, they are, I think, the youngest, uh, healthiest population in British Columbia. So it's, it's really unreasonable for, um, you know, many of those interior communities to be, to be locked down the way they are. Right. And this sort of brings us to the second part of our discussion now that we've taken a look at these seven, uh, these seven recommendations towards governments who are thinking of adopting emergency powers. I just sort of want to get a more broad understanding from each of you about what you think would be the appropriate reaction as opposed to surveillance states and these kinds of things. Where do you think the government could, it's a strange thing for libertarians to talk about this, but where do you think the government could put their resources to help us? I, I hear each of you talking about information. Yeah, instance. education is the only thing, and it's been mentioned, I think, by every one of us, given a lot of information, everyone is going to make the right choice to lock down where they can. No one wants to die. No one wants to get sick. I mean, most of us don't even want to catch a cold. So given that information, people are going to do as much as they can not to, to get sick or not to pass it on to other people. I yeah, I, I also would add to that. Yeah, you're right. I don't want to die and I don't want to kill anyone. Uh, but I also don't want to just live for the sake of being alive. There, there's a difference between being alive and living life. Sure. If you get, catch what I'm saying, right? So, you know, in my mind, being, you know, quarantined or cooped up in my house or unable to go to work, uh, which fortunately enough, I mean, so far, I'm, I'm still able to go to work. Um, you know, the, like I, like I said, you know, there's a difference between just being alive and, and living life, right? And I think that, uh, you know, you look at some stories coming out of California where they are actually in a, in a total lockdown situation and uh, some elderly people are completely refusing to comply with it because, you know, from their point of view, they only have, well, and, and all of us do, we only have a limited time on this earth. Yeah. Right. And uh, and is it moral for a government to um, to take some of that time from us? Right. And 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 completely ruin our plans and our and our hopes and desires for the future. You know, uh, I think there has to be. I think the, the primary function of government in this particular case is is to ensure that we protect our freedoms and our open society. Um, but 
uh, allow individuals to do that in in uh, in whatever way they they think is best, right? And there clearly are a lot of people that think that you know quarantining and self isolation and all that is the way to go. Well, well, let them, right? You know, let them do that if they if they have that ability, then then do that, right? But the the biggest role the government here has to play is is providing the relevant information, uh, the most up to date information. So that, so that people can act on it individually and voluntarily. And I think we might have talked about this at a, at a previous meeting, or maybe it was just individually with one of you guys, but we, we talked about um, what are individual business owners, et cetera, and doing to co combat this. And, and, you know, every grocery store has a lineup. That's not being imposed by government. The government's not telling them other than the whatever, 50 or 100 you know, like that, but there are less people in that in the stores. And um, in my grocery store, local grocery store that I use, they have one way arrows so that in the aisle, so that no one's really passing anyone else. And um, the day and before, those are all without government intervention or laws or, or, or fines, or this is no fear, it's just logic because people want to protect themselves. Yeah, and the day before the order came down for, uh, for dine in you know, restaurants and bars and all that to, to stop doing that. Um, the, I have a, a pub in Richmond close to my house, um, uh, a pub that I go to fairly often. And the, in the week ahead of the, the big shutdown, they spaced out, they removed half the tables from their dining area so that everyone was more spaced out and they prevented people from sitting at the bar. Right, so that they you know, they kept a distance between the employees and the diners, and between the diners and and you know, patrons themselves, right? Yeah. And and again, that was a voluntary measure that was taken, uh, not only to protect the staff of the of the venue, but of the um, of the patrons as well, right? And and those are completely reasonable, right? And then uh, you know, since all this has has gone on. We still obviously have places that are open, you know, gas stations and grocery stores and, and whatnot. And they have, and I don't think it's been an order from the government that's come down. It's just, you know, they, these businesses have taken the information that's been given to them and enacted policies that they ask their customers to follow. Right. Um, there was actually uh, Tim Moen, a uh, leader of the federal libertarian party wrote a, an excellent article or, or an essay, I guess, on, on this whole thing. And, uh, and again, you know, various places around the world, you know, you've got old folks homes and hospitals and uh, in places where, you know, sporting venues and whatnot are still, still allowed to uh, have events. They're, they're doing screening at the door and they're, and they're only taking, um, you know, half the capacity of, um, of what they normally would, or they're restricting the number, you know, the, the number of visitors to a, to a place. Yeah. Again, all completely voluntary on the part of the, uh, the business owner or the venue or, or whatever it may be. Right. And, uh, you know, again, you know, people act on good information. Uh, and, and that's, you know, a, a troubling thing. You know, I see that some of the models that uh, say, you know, the, Dr. Henry and the BC health department use, and it seems to me that they just they they consider uh, society or the, or the people that make up society as just uh, you know just mindless, right? That if, if they're not ordered to do something, yeah. um, or if the government doesn't do something, then then it's just going to be a, a bunch of idiots going around uh, in infecting each other. I completely disagree with that. I, I think that you know people will act intelligently on good information. I, I have a good anecdotal story for that, actually, just just as a, as a, a very quick one, just in general, uh, if you want to talk about like the people that maybe government busybodies would trust the least to make intelligent, important decisions in this regard, uh, the cannabis community in Vancouver shut down every dispensary that involved like every smoking lounge, anywhere where they were sharing their smoking implements. That happened way before the government ordered restaurants and dine-in places to like, before any rules or regulations came down, they went, well, we don't want people to get sick and they shut the doors right away. And so I think we're hammering on an important point here, which is there is an assumption that people make uh, that 
we won't act on good information or we won't act properly uh -huh. on good information. There's a disregard for our sort of mutual self-interest, I guess. It's an elitist attitude. What do you right? mean? It means that they, you know, the people that are in charge think that we're all a bunch of idiots or that we're stupid and that, it, and you know, if, if, yeah, and, and that they're not and that they know what's best for the rest of us. And uh, that's completely not the case at all. I, you know, again, I think that given good information, people will act on it, right? As we've seen, I mean, people are wearing masks and, and uh, doing what they can to protect themselves. I'll, uh, I'll throw a second anecdotal story in here that's completely different. Um, so I lost my job throughout all of this. And my job is an example of how, of how this is impacting people regardless of government response, because my industry would have died through voluntary means. Um, maybe the only order that came down was the gatherings of 50 or more people. So the industry I work in is audio video for big conferences and meetings that companies have at hotels. You know, they go into a hotel with 150 of their employees and have a big party and throw a presentation up and, and do all this. That industry, I, 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 I can't over uh, uh, describe it to you, like, like the speed with which we lost our business. It was a two week window I went from working full time plus overtime to zero hours and it happened in like two weeks. And so that's without any government ordering anyone to do anything, there's still major economic implications because that's every location for my company across Canada. Every hotel in Canada is pretty much shut down. Uh, it, it varies a little bit from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but like the, the, you know, the waterfront hotel where I worked at is, is been closed for months now. And so all of those people have been displaced and that wasn't the government ordering them to do that. That was a decision they made. The hotels are closed or just like the, the hotel is rooms? the hotel is shut down. It's completely empty. Wow. And, and I walked around Vancouver downtown for about two hours a couple days ago. I was just wandering around just to see what was going on. And the number of businesses I've seen just with posted messages in the windows, we have decided, you know, we've taken a look at the information and we've decided for the best of our clients and our customers, our employees, we're shutting down our doors until further notice. Every third door you walk past is boarded up with a message like that. Yeah, and mm. I, I guess I'm I'm not I'm not really making a, a a salient point there, other than to point out that that's you know that's besides never mind all the damage that government can do with with regulation and restrictions on our ability to trade and and participate in the economy. But every single action they take needs to to be taken with extreme caution and and needs to be a human approach. It has to take into account every single one of those people that just lost all of their income. Uh, and and it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like their response is necessarily a human-based approach as much as a, I don't know, a point and tell approach. It's not concerned with what people want, it's what people ought to do, if that makes sense. Well, and it's, uh, yeah, well, and it's, what it is, is it, it seems like the people making these decisions um, don't value freedom and quality of life. Right. It, again, it's the, you know, save a few lives at any cost sort of attitude. And they and they completely disregard any of the um, externalities related to that. Right. Whether it's economic or social and, and, and just the consequences of such a policy. And I don't mean that as far as businesses voluntarily shutting down and, you know, and I understand that negatively affects their employees. But it's the, the government edicts. Right. You know, and and uh, unfortunately, even though BC has had a measure, measured approach to this whole thing, the, the few orders that they have given down as far as, you know, banning public gatherings and sporting events and, and uh, shutting down, um, you know, bars and restaurants, and, you know, all the dine-in aspects of all that. Uh, I mean, that's, that's having a huge effect. And especially in a place like Vancouver where, uh, you know, a huge amount of the population, you know, is in the service industry. Right. Um, you know, just and, and then, you know, the disruption to everything, schooling, you know, kids can't go to school anymore. And so because the kids can't go to school, even if the parents uh, still had a job to go to, they can't really go to it because they got to take care of their kids. I mean, there's just so many elements to this equation that, that negatively affect it and uh, or negatively affect society, I should say. And uh, at the root of it all, I think that the problem is, is that the government or the people in, in government making these decisions um, don't either don't value or they, or they in some way devalue um, 
quality of life and and individual freedom right and I, freedom. I think I think you have that exactly right because you can almost imagine that the um, argument against what you just said there would act, in fact be a devaluing of human freedom and and uh, like their arguments are yeah but we have to save those lives. And there is no but. That's exactly. That's what no we're but. talking about here. Is there is no yeah but when it comes to freedom and quality of life. That's what we're fighting for here. Right, and that ties into what I was saying a little earlier. Right, there's a difference between uh, being alive and living life. We yeah. can't. We can't do the things that uh, you know our hopes and dreams that we had for the future. Everything has been put on hold because of this thing. Right, and uh, at, at some point it's going to have to return to normal. And I, and I don't buy that, uh, that this is the new normal, no. right? I, I think that eventually we're going to have to get back to, you know, shaking hands with our friends, right? Or having a cheers when we're at the, when, when we're at the pub, um, you know, hugging our parents, right? You know, I want nothing more right now than to go back to Alberta and go visit my parents. And my parents are, are 66 and 67, Right, my grand, my grandmother in Nanaimo. I haven't been able to visit her since January, and uh, you know she's 97. And so I, I'm just waiting for the all clear here, mm -hmm. right? You know, I just I want to know, uh, you know, if if I had some means to get myself tested to you know figure out whether or not I've yeah. had this disease before or, or whatever, I would do it, right? Just so I could carry on with life, right? And I and listen, there's all sorts of controversy and conspiracy theories and everything surrounding the World Health Organization. We don't need to go down that rabbit hole today, but um, I mean, it, it seems to me, and again, with, I, with the evidence that has come out recently in terms of the infection rates and whatnot, and, and uh, the fact that most, most people that, or it seems to me, seems to be that most people that get this virus are completely asymptomatic and never even know they've had it in the first place, you know, and, and again, more variables to, to take into account is the viral load, right? The people at highest risk in terms of our age groups are the healthcare workers, right? Because they're the ones dealing with, you know, these cases day in and day out and they, and they actually expose themselves to high levels of this virus, you know, every single day, right? Whereas, uh, you know, you and I, or, or um, we, we, um, the way we're going to catch it is if, you know, maybe you know, the highest levels we'll get is if someone inadvertently sneezes on us or whatever, but, but otherwise, you know, touching a doorknob or, a, you know, a contaminated surface, uh, it's a pretty low viral load. And, and so our body has that extra time to react to it. Right. And uh, th these are things you don't hear about in the mainstream media, again, because it's completely sensationalized. To talk about this in the correct way is way more complicated than I would say the way most media outlets and most politicians are dumbing it down and discussing it. To talk about it properly. Uh, and so, so really, uh, the mainstream media is still, it's it's so it's so dead. It's just it's a dead man walking. I know that's not the subject we're on today, but it's part no, of this problem. They're in America. proving it right now. They're proving it during this crisis for sure because it's all about sensationalism and clicks and headlines and controversy. It, 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 it is, and 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 we're and I I hate to keep using American examples, but you know in some ways they're they're further along down the road in some things than we are, and their their media has been so sensationalist and so partisan and so unreliable for years that when finally something serious came down the pipeline, nobody believed them. They have no credibility. It's the boy, it's it's a case of the the boy who cried wolf. Yeah. yeah, and that loops back to what we're saying about the need for good information. That is a serious problem because when our sense and they had it wrong. organs are not working anymore, when we can't make sense of the world the way we used to, which was by trusting that the news was at least trying to tell us the truth, the whole I mean, conversation becomes harder to have. Who has the proper information then? if it's not right. the people we trusted. So the sense-making organisms have broken down, or the sense-making yeah. organs, I should say. I, I think this is quite incredible. Uh, mayor of New York, uh, Bill de Blasio, actually told people to snitch on their neighbors. I kind of want to switch roles to the social impact here a little bit about way, how people are acting and behaving and treating one another during this time. This isn't widespread. I actually think that for the most part, what, you know, what we might call the people are, are sort of resistant to this snitch culture that is trying to be, at least from what I've seen, that's just my totally anecdotal reading of it, but it seems like there's a push for, from politicians and from these elitist 
type of people, again, it's a disregarding of sort of the human factor. It's like you're not acting properly and therefore what you want, your desires in life, what you're trying to do with your day is meaningless to us. Uh, we're going to call the cops on you. And, and you know, you guys, you guys keep mentioning elderly people. It reminds me of one story I saw where someone posted a note on this poor old woman's door, some 70, 80 year old woman mm. uh, saying, you know, we see you meeting with your family and friends. And if you keep doing it, we'll call the police. And you have to imagine this poor elderly woman. I mean, what else do you have to look forward to as a retiree beyond family and that social connection that you have? I'm worried about the social impact there of people snitching and people- I just leave a note right back in return saying, go ahead, call the cops. Yeah, call the cops. You know. <laughs> and, and again, it, it comes back to to what I said earlier, you know, and, it's, and it's, you know, we only have a limited time on this earth, right? And if you're an, if you're a little old lady, you you really want nothing more than to hug your grandkids and 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 see your own kids, uh, you know, you you've only got so much time left. Well, not even just right? want, you might need that. I mean, if you're you, if you've got no job and you've got nothing else going on in your life, the mental health aspect of having good social connections is is paramount. It's paramount. well, and and then even more being able to go outside and get some exercise. Yeah, right. I don't understand closing down the public parks. That to me is a bizarre reaction because parks to me inherently seem like a safer place to be than anywhere inside. Yeah, well, it's, it's funny because it, the virus transmits almost exclusively in closed quarters. Yeah. Yeah, so this this seems like a bizarre reactionary sort of thing. On right, the and they close the public parks. And I, I read an article, I think I might have even posted it um, recently, where in Australia, they're they're looking, they're taking helicopters to to get the, the really remote campers. Oh my I mean, God. What is your end game there? First of all, to have to approach these people to, even just to tell them to move, you know, you have to get, you it's have insanity. to reach all these, these protocols. <laughs> Well, that's it's very frightening. Then that's extreme social distancing, but they don't want that. It makes me wonder what the hell's your end game if, well, if these people no, are such and, a threat. And there again, it's 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 the the decision makers, you know, whether it's in government or law enforcement or or anything in between, you know, it's a devaluing of of human freedom and human flourishing. Right. Yeah. We you know the fact that people can't go outside, you know, camping and, and going out to the back country. Are you kidding me? Like that is the, that is the ultimate in, in physical distancing or, or social isolation, right? You know, disperse the population out into the, you told out into me the to, wilderness. You told me to stay six feet away. I went 60,000 feet away and I exactly. don't know what your problem is. <laughs> it doesn't make any, any sense at all. Right. And, and just the, the, the thing that's really troubling out of this whole thing is it's the universality of it, right? And, and it's, it's the disregard of the, especially the data that's come out recently in terms of infection rates and prevalence and, and whatnot, but, but the, um, just, just well, how illogical it is. You um, should check out the, um, I think I posted on, on Facebook this morning, uh, Oxford's latest estimate of the fatality of coronavirus, their their current their updated estimate is 0.1 to 0.36, yep. which which is about the same as the flu. The flu, yeah, yeah. And, and isn't that Just what Elsie himself has said that? Now like that's in, now, in, a, in a paper he wrote. And oh. and I've and I and I didn't I don't know if I saw that specific article or or, or post of yours, Don, but. Um, I, I've seen a similar statistic in basically in that the spread across the entire population, uh, the the uh, mortality rate of this is is very similar to the flu, right? It's certainly more contagious and it has a longer incub incubation period. Well, it um, might be it might be more contagious just because it's novel. Right? Yeah, I mean that that's right? so true. We don't have yeah, any Again, immunity to it at all. We're facing it for for the first time so and and there's another gap in the data the fact is is that this disease is not an equal opportunity killer right it, it doesn't it's not like ebola you know where uh it whether it was you me or my 97 year old grandmother getting infected our chances of dying are basically the same whether we get ebola um this covid virus is, you know affects a very narrow group of people 
And so the government response here, and, and particularly from a libertarian point of view, um, should be to protect freedom and to protect our open society, right? Again, providing us with the valuable information we need to, uh, to act accordingly, right? And if the government is going to take an action, uh, it should be to protect those vulnerable groups exclusively, right? And not, not enforce a universal lockdown. Don't treat everyone as equally because we're not affected by this virus equally. Right, so it, it's ridiculous to to treat it as such. This this um, might be the crux of the libertarian argument. I think is the that we are against the universality of of public policies being applied to all demographics because it flies in the face of the data that we are continuing okay. to. Okay, all right. Let me play devil's advocate here for a second. Yes, <laughs> I hear you. I agree with you. But okay, now that say everyone's agreeing with us too. Um, how are you going to implement that? So are, you know, the vulnerable people going to get a special card or the rest of us going to get no. a special card? Like I'm allowed out of my house card or Not like, at all. how does this, how is this going to work? Look at how the government, information. okay, so, well, it is information, Don, absolutely right. You know, again, they, they can universally provide the information we need. Right. But, you know, the, the government has a lot of retirement homes that are under, you know, that they're government funded or government controlled. They've got a lot of long term care homes. Our entire health care system is controlled by the government. Right. So we can they can restrict access to these particular areas. Right. Or, or do some pre screening, you know, take specific measures to to protect the vulnerable people in those spots like they're they're already pretty concentrated in in certain spots right and there again the in the information we get is critical as well right uh, so my grandmother and she's 97 years old she still lives on her own but she lives in a gated uh, kind of retirement community and and so the government you know if they're going to spend these huge sums of money on anything then let's put you know hire a private security guard or or i mean for all i care put an rcmp officer out in front of that gate and have uh, have visitors uh, do a screening right take their temperature or or use one of those antibody tests or you know whatever it may be but you know do something to protect those yeah. particular vulnerable groups that are generally pretty concentrated um, just, you know, even before this crisis, you know, they're just generally in, in retirement parks or retirement homes or long-term care facilities or hospitals, whatever it may be, and, and protect them, right? But, okay, but to so shut down the rest of society. That, are you saying now these people aren't going to be allowed to go in and out? No, I didn't say that. Just protect, the, the, protect outsiders from, from going in and putting, putting those people at risk. Right. If those people want to come and go, then then let them. But they'll be s still subject to the to the screening as well. I, I think you know it, it looks very similar to what's going on now, but it's just a bit more limited and focused. You know, um, you're you know maybe you're still trying not to get too close to vulnerable people. Um, you can still have you know the senior hours at the grocery store and the banks and things like this. Um, you know, maybe we put some resources into some some extra resources into their care workers. So we're maybe we're paying for hotel um, hotels for these people, so they can you know particularly stay away, or or, or we're providing um, executive assistance um, to people like this, so they can not go out uh, to to the, to the people who provide care for for the elderly or the vulnerable. I think things like that. I, I don't. And I think almost all of it could be done on a voluntary basis. You know, yeah. um, I agree. Totally Don, to your point, I think that would actually cost a lot less than these programs for that ultimately the, the taxpayer. I mean, it used to be that my, my future grandchildren are still going to be in debt, but now it's going to be worse than that. Great grandchildren. Oh, yeah, great, great grandchildren. We haven't <laughs> even talked about the CERB and the, the economic distort, uh, distortions that that's going to cause. Uh, right. With a third of the population not working for four months. Yeah, like, the, uh, that's a, unfortunately that's that's outside of our wheelhouse as a provincial yeah. party, though. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's true. Paul. That's correct. I was totally about to dive down that rabbit hole, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, again, I think that that 
government policy needs to be clear here. You know, what's the, what's the goal? Is the goal eradication of the disease? If so, that's completely unreasonable and should be shut down. Like that whole argument should be shut down immediately. You're, you're just not going to eradicate this disease. You know, even with a vaccine, we have vaccines for the flu virus and it's and still that's around. How, yeah, that's how we right? got rid of the flu. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, anyway, we could, we could bring up all sorts of memes about, about, banning things and how it's completely ended it right uh whatever it may be you know murder has been banned and yet obviously yep. you know there's still murder out there um you know so our, our goal here has to be management of the disease and there there is something to be said about uh, you know the herd immunity argument uh and again the the social and economic costs of shutting down the entire economy just to save a few people um you know the the idea of of doing that just to, you know, save as many lives as possible at any cost. Uh, I mean, and that being the operative part of that phrase is at, at any cost, you know, at, yeah, at what well, point, at what point does the cost become too high? At what point is the cost too much? Well, at one point we're going to be swapping one kind of death for another kind of death. Yeah. Suicide is, is directly related to unemployment rates. We know this. Um, and, and we talked earlier about, about domestic abuse, et cetera, et cetera, drug abuse, substance abuse is going up. So at one point, we might be, you know, some people might not be dying of, of the corona, but they'll be dying of other things. So It's already happening. It, it right? is already happening, and, yes. And, un and unfortunately, the costs to shutting down the economy and shutting down businesses and preventing people from actually living their lives, um, those costs are going to be spread out over, the, over a decade. Right. You know, everything, every single day that we're shut down affects people in a negative way for for weeks or months uh, thereafter. Right. In terms of, you know, say the growth of their business or their ability to save and accumulate money, um, you know, all and our ability to travel. Right. You know, we've got these major sweeping travel bans. And, and again, you know, are we are we taking a sledgehammer to people's lives when we should be using a scalpel? You know, Agreed. like we, That's you know, an we, excellent analogy. That's a great way to put it, Paul. You know, we're, we're ruining uh, so many people's lives again at, at so-called any cost. Well, the, the cost has already been too high. You know, we're, we're a month into this uh, three weeks or a month into this, uh, you know, general shutdown of the economy. And I, I can't see it being justified in any way. In fact, it's completely impractical and, and immoral. So never mind ramping up the surveillance state. We've already gone too far and it's time to start going the other direction and talking yeah. about, about this new data that as it rolls in. I, I did like seeing on the National Post, uh, John Carpe uh, wrote an article called, uh, it's uh, entitled, Alberta's Bill 10 is an affront to the rule of law which I yes. thought was nice, clear language. Yeah, and and like it is that. important for us to speak out about this because it does seem like if nobody's watching, <laughs> they will do anything. They will but, do anything. Again, credit where credit is due as far as the, you know, the premiers across Canada, Jason Kenney included, and John Horgan. Um, you know, when Trudeau tried his little trick to enact the Emergencies Act, yep. uh, you know, our revamped yes. version of the War Measures Act, basically all the premiers except for New Brunswick's premier said, hell no. No, yeah, no, right? that's too far. And uh, credit to the feds as well, to the conservatives for standing up against unlimited spending powers for two years. Yeah, at least two at years. least a couple conservatives anywhere, Pierre Polivare and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, who uh, honestly- Michelle is Rempel. Pierre is really growing on me throughout this crisis. Yeah, ditto. He's, yeah. Um, he's yeah. taking it to him. And I don't even know how, but I think he did like an interview, like a Skype interview with his arch enemy, Bill Morneau, uh, which is quite worth watching. Um, oh, really? Well, because they're still trying to keep certain parliamentary debates and stuff and discussions going. They're social distancing too, right? The house mm -hmm. has been closed. So, right. Yeah. So, well, because- Which brings us back to due process. The, and this is the problem, right, is we have literally seen in Canada, we are watching politicians like Justin Trudeau trying to gain unlimited spending power, trying to make the finance minister one of the more powerful people on the planet. The most powerful well, on the planet. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I, I mean that because when yeah. you're talking about direct access to a nation's 
<laughs> money the printing checkbook. press. Article yeah, two checkbook. Bill more no. Bill money bags more no. A blank check to Canada's bank for two years. That's beyond. So, you know, I, I uh, I've heard that the uh, the UK Parliament and the UK House of Lords are are basically doing sessions over Zoom. Yep. Right. And uh, so why why can't Canadian why can't Parliament we? do the same? Right. Well, they don't necessarily under- have to fly to Ottawa and and sit yeah. together in the chamber. Credit where credit's due. I believe that is what's happening. I think they are trying to to get the process up. But you know, Can- Canada and computer systems, the Canadian government and the, <laughs> and any computer is is an immediate issue that needs extra time to be resolved. <clears throat> Phoenix. Yeah, well, <laughs> everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> everybody knows. I think. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it wasn't a uh, share on whatever lately saying that he wants to bring parliament in into physically into the into into being again i think that's a mistake i don't again the data that's coming out suggests that that uh most people are have really nothing to i shouldn't say nothing to fear but they have little to fear with this virus and and uh they only need uh what is it? Thirty MPs out of all three hundred and some to to form quorum in the House of Commons. So again, MPs can take voluntary measures if they don't want to show up. They don't have to, or you know, they can figure out a way to do it through video conference or whatever. But I see no reason why the uh, younger and more able-bodied of MPs, Pierre Polivier, Justin Trudeau, even right, he's a younger guy and in and in pretty good shape. There's no reason why he can't go sit in parliament where he's supposed to be and where he's expected to be as a as a lawmaker and a legislator they could right? certainly at least take take measures right do testing do screening like we're talking about doing at airports and stuff 100%. why not do this at the government buildings so that the country doesn't grind to a halt yeah well but then again you know from a libertarian point of view there's a case to be made that uh, you know the less the government does the better right and we so want they, the country if, ground to a halt <laughs> well we want the we want the government to be slowed down anyway in terms of the actions that they can carry out and uh, you know look look at some of the th- things that this that, that our federal government anyway not so much the provincial government but the federal government really has tried to to push through as as we talked about you know the sweeping powers given to the prime minister and the finance minister um, you know, no, no, um, no review or due process over, um, you know, spending and taxation or anything else, right? It can just be issued by a decree. Yes. And that, uh, that's absolutely, um, the insane. Americans fought a war over taxation without exactly. representation. I think well, a lot of them have forgotten that. Yeah. Well, they, they fought a war, but, uh, you know, even, uh, even, an even more pointed message to our political leaders would be is that kings and, and presidents and prime ministers have been hanged over far less. <laughs> over far right. less. Yes. So, <laughs> you know, keep, keep that in mind. And anyway, that would be my message to uh, our, our political leaders is, <laughs> you know, you're only going to be able to go so far with this. Um, in, yeah. in my view, they've already gone too far and I'm, I'm not an advocate for violence or anything uh, but I, I certainly think a, a point is going to come here where the people are just going to say, we have had enough. Well, I, more people I, are going yeah. to. Right now, there's already protesters saying, forget this. We're going out. We're doing this. And, and I think we'll see more. Mass in front of- we'll see more and more of that. We're going to see mass civil disobedience against the law. Yeah. And, 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 we're, and we will see businesses reopening as well. In and, I, and I surely hope that, uh, that that civil disobedience is peaceful. It's just... I just want people to go back about, you know, go go back running their lives and, and living their lives, right? That's really the, the key here. Um, before we close out the, the discussion here, guys, I, yeah. I really, I want to share uh, three names uh, of, of really reliable, thoughtful uh, information regarding this whole thing. And, and uh, both from the scientific, biological point of view, in terms of you know where I get my information from, uh, you know in terms of the uh, the infection rates and whatnot, uh, Dr. David Katz, he's from Stanford University. Uh, look up some of his stuff. He's written a couple articles. Uh, I think he uh, most recently put one out on Medium.com, and that's uh, Katz uh, K A T Z. And then uh, uh, his name's uh, John Ionidis. 
I think is how you pronounce his name. He's uh, a, a Greek American. Uh, his last name is spelled I O A N N I D I S. And he also is from Stanford and I think has something to do with Yale University as well. He's a uh, medical statistician and he's also put out some really good information uh, regarding the infection rates and, and whatnot. Um, oh, sorry, and, and one more is, um, oh, I can't remember the doctor's name, but if you go to the YouTube channel Uncommon Knowledge with Peter Robinson, it's a, a channel of the Hoover Institute, uh, they just recently did an interview with a doctor, and he's the one that did the uh, uh, epide epidemiological study in Santa Clara County in California, where they have really determined that the infection rates are much higher than we thought, and thus the morbidity rates are much lower than what we thought. I'm going to butcher and, this, but it's Dr. J. Bhattacharya. That's, yes, exactly. That's, that's him. Yeah. And, then, and then my number one source for just clear thinking on, uh, on just any major issue in particular, but he's been putting out some really good stuff uh, on, the, on the COVID situation is uh, Alex Epstein. And he is a, um, a philosopher and public speaker. And his, the way he's able to break down a lot of these arguments uh, is, is just absolutely incredible. And, um, you know, his, his big push is, is that we just need to be pro-freedom and, and pro-human flourishing. And, and that the role of the government here is to uh, create the conditions to, to preserve both of those things.